Thank you everyone for joining us and jumping in. We are so excited to be having this conversation today as the um, the debut of version two for our employer engagement guidebook. Um, if you are a partner to the community college growth engine or part of our innovator network or at all familiar with the lab, you know that we do a lot with highlighting the work of our, of our partners and different best practices across the country. It's important for us to have that opportunity for you all to get a sense for what are other colleges doing? What are other you know, institutions and ecosystems doing to demonstrate best practices for as it relates to employer engagement? This is an area where there is no one way to do things. And so having tools and resources and the level of flexibility to think about how you want to intentionally engage with those eco ecosystem partners is critical to the success of micro pathway work and really any of your programs at your institution. So we are thrilled to have this conversation today. We're gonna talk a little bit about the guidebook. We have a panel discussion coming up. Um, and with that, we will go ahead and move to the agenda. I'll do a quick overview of that. Perfect. So my name is Rachel Kahn. I'm the Deputy Director for the Community College Growth Engine here at the lab, leading the, the Community College Growth Engine. And I have the privilege of working with several of our design teams. So excited to see lists, folks on the, the participant panelists here, uh, here with us today that I get to work with on a pretty regular basis. And we're going to do an overview of the updated guidebook. Joe Davis is going to walk us through some of those pieces along with the phases of engagement. And then I will moderate a panel discussion with a couple of our institution and employer partners so we can hear right from them how they're implementing some of these practices. And then we'll share a little bit of a, a wrap up around the guidebook itself and then invite you to join us in our new community of practice on LinkedIn. So more about that coming. Uh, and so with that, I will hand it over to Joe Davis to kick us off with the overview. Thanks, Rachel. And again, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, really excited to roll out this um, second version of our employer engagement guidebook. Our first, our first guidebook was published in 2021 uh, through the learnings of our first cohort. And this guidebook has extended to over 50 community colleges and multiple studies that we've pulled in to really inform our practices and try to give the colleges that we work with as much information about developing a holistic employer engagement process as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk through the five phases of engagement uh, as, as we've, we see them through our learnings. Uh, we'll, ident we'll identify um, the ladder of engagement or the level of partnership uh, that you that you want to develop through your framework with each with each employer. And then we'll talk a little bit about our T profile tool, um, which is something that we've helped uh, we've utilized to help increase the dialogue between employers and institutions about the technical and durable skills that are essential for each role. I know that this looks a little small, uh, but this is our this is our, this graphic is of our five phases of engagement. These phases are based on, based on um, the commonalities across the resources that inform this guidebook uh, and and from all of our learning. So we tried to make a step-by-step -step approach that was easy to consume and easy to understand so that you can follow it, follow along with it and really create a structure for yourself, um, for your institution, for your employer engagement pro processes. The first phase is understanding the landscape. We really want to look at what exists, um, what exists at the colleges, what your strengths are, what some areas uh, in, that you may need to improve on are, uh, what, what employer partnerships already exist, uh, what initiatives are taking place that, that can, be, can be leveraged in this work. The second phase is establishing an internal commitments for sustainable structure. So really creating a, an internal plan and sharing that plan across departments, uh, with all of your internal stakeholders so that things are not siloed and everyone understands what the plan is uh, and how to approach it. Really, so many of the colleges we've worked with in the past have really successful departments with employer engagement, but we want to take those learnings and, and, and build that into a structure that, that everyone can get on board with. The third phase is developing a holistic ecosystem. This is where a lot of the work from the college towards external partners is gonna take place. 
So really attracting uh, sector partnerships, engaging your workforce boards, your chambers of commerce, all of your external partners who can be a part of this work and, and help add to the robustness of, of your ecosystem. The fourth phase is uh, de designing a dynamic talent journey. This is where the employer work really comes in. So we really want to pull employers to help give us information about what they're looking for in candidates, help us co-create and design micro pathways, uh, help us think about how programs could stack and, and lead to future employment, employment attainment for learners. And then finally, the fifth phase is measuring impact and feedback loops. So that's where we're going to evaluate data, we're going to look at our success stories and maybe some things that we might need to reiterate on um, through the process. So the first phase, understanding the landscape, what we really want to do is explore what is and understand what already exists. As I said before, you know, you really want to look at uh, what are your strengths? So what partnerships already exist? Do Is your, is your, um, workforce director on the WIB board? Do you already have relationships with certain departments? I know many, many institutions who have strong manufacturing ties. There, there are often relationships that already exist there, or maybe it's your healthcare department that has those relationships, and you really want to leverage the way things are done there to build out a process for your college as a whole. Uh, next is identify areas of potential growth. So really not looking at this through the lens of, you know, a negative, but really where are there opportunities to make more connections? Where are there opportunities to share information internally? Um, where, who are some, where are some sectors or employers that you may want to connect with? Uh, then we'll talk heavily about evaluating labor market information. So understanding everything that exists um, so that we can create create programs that are going to serve local businesses that are going to lead towards employment opportunities for learners. And then really go out and get those stakeholder perspectives. So talking to employers, talking to learners about what it is that they want, what they're trying to achieve through their education, talking to, to people internally at the college about their thoughts in their processes, and then talking to further partners out, you know, such as such as those workforce boards, the state system leads, so that everyone is on the same page moving forward. This is an image that we've developed through our learnings uh, through the first three cohorts and uh, through our project uh, with with our our fellowship program. Really about all of the components that go into occupation select selection. So labor market information and data is not just one thing, right? We look at from a labor market information perspective. Often we are looking at data um, about high growth careers, in demand careers, labor projections, long term salary projections, but that's really just one piece of of the one component of, of the whole story. So again, like I said, we want to understand, you know, what is it that careers, what careers do, do our learners interested in, in developing skills for? Um, what programs already exist at your institution that are successful or that are leading to people towards successful um, occupations? How do we make those connections? How do we build upon, um, upon what already already exists? What are the what's the college mission, vision, and goals? Um, what system, local, and state level initiatives might be taking place uh, that we want to leverage for this work? Uh, there's often funding funding tied to that. There's also opportunities to create uh, partnerships and and recognize champions through those pieces. So as you can see, there's a lot of intersection points between all of this information, and what we want to do is capture that so that we can make the best decisions possible about developing micro pathways. The second phase is establishing internal commitments for a sustainable structure. And what that really means is developing an internal plan. So creating a shared vision. This shouldn't live with just one department. Um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't live in just one place. It should be something that's known across the college 
if there's a coordinated approach, that means people know um, what actions and what responsibilities they have towards employer engagement, um, who is the connection points, who, who are communicating with employers, and, and really breaking down those silos across levels and across departments. One way that we all, one thing we also want to do here is develop develop a value proposition with employers. So uh, here's an example of a of an email template that we uh, utilize in in help uh, help institutions develop and send out. Really telling employers what it is that the college has to offer, what their goals are with micro pathways and and train and stackable training programs, and then. Um, asking employers to commit to be a part of this. And that's where the um, ladder of engagement will come in uh, in the next phase. So phase three, as I said, is, is really where the work um, internally comes uh, from the college. And this is building partnerships. And this can be very overwhelming. Um, there is, you know, it's, it's a lot to think about. You know, how do you approach college? Uh, how do you approach employers? How do you ask them? Um, to be a part of your process? How do you establish relationships and keep those relationships going? Um, it's, it's a lot to think about. Um, what we really try to do is break that down into individual steps. And I think you'll see from some of the panelists that they haven't figured out all of, all of their partnership yet, but they have initiated those relationships and really taken steps towards building these partnerships that they're going to continue to lean into and build upon. So as we build these partnerships, we wanna make sure that we're identifying all of the key players, all of the ecosystem partners who can be a part of our work, uh, employers and, and extended partners as well. We wanna focus on systems. Often we might start with a partnership with one employer, um, but we wanna make sure that we are serving a, a sector or an industry and that we're pulling as many um, employers from that sector or industry together so that we are not contingent on just that one employer, but that we have multiple relationships that are informing our practices and, and our pathways so that we're designing to serve multiple businesses and continuing to grow the institution's reputation as well as partnerships. <clears throat> Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is our, our ladder of engagement. So generally we send that out with our um, value proposition to give employers an idea of what these commitments are. This by no means means, you know, if, if an employer says that they're willing to be an advisor or co-designer or partner, that we that they're going to necessarily do all of these components, but it's just to give you an idea of the levels. So an advisor really is someone who might come in and provide salary and wage data. They might give you information on technical skills and, and durable skills that they need for someone to be successful. They might sit in in industry roundtables or participate in job fairs. Uh, and they might even commit to interviewing individuals who, who complete a uh, micro pathway. The next level would be a co-designer. These individuals are going to, these employers are going to be the ones that are going to be a little more engaged, so they would do all the things that an advisor does, but they also might be willing to uh, conduct on-site tours and provide continuous feedback on programs and the, the success of candidates who have come through those programs. Uh, they might be willing to participate in grant funding applications, and, and hopefully they're willing to commit to hire directly from the pool of talent that you have. The highest level of um, of engagement is is a partner, and that's going to be an employer who's willing to offer a work based learning opportunity, um, or a job shadow, uh, or an internship where students can come in and and you know really be part of the institution as well as part of the employer. Uh, they may provide holistic support such as funding or resources to learners so that they can continue their education. And this is generally formalized uh, through a, a, a memorandum of understanding. Um, the fourth phase is designing a dynamic talent journey. So this is where we really ask employers to come in and do their part. So what we're looking to do is leverage those employer uh, partnerships 
in our program design and really have them inform us uh, what type of skills they're looking for. And, and we utilize our T-Profile tool, which I'll get to in a second to do that. We also want to make sure that we are helping individuals transition from education into employment. Workforce development is the responsibility of everyone in higher education. That's why people go to college, um, is so that they can get careers. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're providing those opportunities and making those connections as much as possible, especially from the community college perspective. I think this is one of the great strengths of the community college is that really shows them the door and the opportunities, number one, to build their, their skill set um, throughout their career, but also show them the on and off ramps that exist both with education and with employers' job opportunities so that they can continually come back and, and continually advance in their careers. So one of the tools that we have continued to iterate on that we really believe in and, and we are um, utilizing to make those connections between employers and institutions is a T-profile tool. What it allows us to do is take a job title um, such as medical office assistant, and then bring in those employers to tell us exactly what durable or 21st century skills are most important, as well as to map out all the technical skills and credentials that are required for someone in that job. Generally, we ask for someone in the job, uh, as well as a supervisor and an HR manager to come in and give us this information. So we have multiple perspectives and we can coordinate all of their answers so that the institutions can actually see what type of feedback they're getting and use this as they map their curriculum. And then once the curriculum is mapped, we can bring it back to the employers and say, okay, here's what we did based off of your feedback. Here's what we've created. How committed to, to this program are you? So um, this is really a tool that we've utilized to help deepen those relationships. Um, and, and it's a great opportunity to make those connections individually with employers. The fifth phase is measuring impact and feedback loops. So what we wanna do here is really evaluate our programs, evaluate what we've built, evaluate uh, the learnings of students. Uh, and this really requires us to implement data strategies with employers, come up with ways of tracking students uh, so that we can track student success, um, and so that we can also understand what shortcomings they might have as they complete programs. This will help us, number one, sustain partnerships, continue to keep those lines of communication open, let employers know that your institution is here to continue to listen to them, and it's continuing to grow your programs so that it meets their needs. It helps you make collective decisions as ecosystem partners about the best approaches towards developing micro pathways and stackable educational opportunities. It'll help you attract funding. Um, you know, we have, there, there are lots of grant opportunities out there and having those partnerships and that, and that data to support, um, to support your programs is really gonna help long-term. And then we want you to, to tell your story, you know, to have those anecdotes of individuals who have been successful, who have joined the workforce based off of their education with your institution, and then come back and continue to move up that career ladder and tell that collective story. Number one, to promote both your institution and your employer partners, and simultaneously um, attract other employers from maybe other industries and sectors who might wanna be a partner and work with you in these same ways. Now, by no means is, is that the, the entire story of our employer engagement strategy. And, and you know, as, as Rachel alluded to uh, at the beginning, we are continuously learning. Uh, this is our second version of this. And we wanna make sure that um, we are highlighting uh, the partnerships and, and the actions that colleges that we're working with are currently taking. And we're going to continue to iterate on this and learn and build upon it as time goes on. Um, I'm going to pass it back over to Rachel now, who is going to uh, discuss with some of our uh, innovative partners uh, what they're doing. Perfect. Thanks so much, Joe. 
Um, and before we jump into that piece of it, I did see a couple of questions come in on the Q&A, and I do want to make sure that I have a chance to address those. So someone asked, how many employers and workers do you typically bring to a T-profile session? And I would say that that varies. So we have the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with an individual employer, and sometimes that is a, a great way to have those deeper, more meaningful conversations one-on-one -on -one with an employer. You can also set it up where maybe you're doing an industry T-profile session, where you go and, you know, let's say it's a 90-minute session, and you spend the first half an hour talking about the program and how it can support employers and what their needs are, understanding a little bit about the landscape of that specific sector or industry that you're focusing on, and then spending that last 60 minutes working with them um, to fill out those T profiles together. So there's a couple of different ways that to run a T profile session, and it can be from one to, you know, maybe five to seven employers, I think would probably be comfortable. Um, but, you know, if you're working with us and, um, you know, we're always happy to provide support and resources for that, whether you're one of our design team colleges or not. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us if that's something that you're interested in engaging in, and we're happy to help and, and talk through a plan with that for you. Um, someone else asked, do you incentivize workers in HR to come to the T profile activity and how do you get them to participate? And that is a fabulous question because I know that getting engagement from our employer partners can sometimes be a little bit challenging. We have those employer partners who are just naturally really wonderful and engaged and want to do this work with us. There are others that find it a little bit more challenging to, you know, take time from their day to dedicate to these conversations. And that's why Joe shared that ladder of engagement, knowing that there's different levels and tiers of engagement that employers can engage in based on their comfort level. So we would love for them to be full partners in this work and to come for a larger T profile session and then give us some feedback and maybe even come to a design session or two to give some of that more hyper-focused uh, critical analysis. But if what they can give us is 15 minutes to complete a feedback form, we're good with that too. And so we try to make those different opportunities available so that there's multiple ways to gather employer engagement feedback and that it's not just all or nothing. Um, so that I think is the critical piece. And earlier on, I talked a little bit about needing to have just multiple tools and resources that you can pull from to create that employer engagement plan for your institution in a way that makes sense. So getting comfortable using those tools and resources and being flexible to what the need of the employer is and the sense you're getting from them, right? If you pick up the phone and call and like they're already rushing you off the phone because they just don't have time for this conversation, that's probably gonna be your feedback form survey group, right? But if you get somebody on the phone and they're like, oh yeah, why don't you come down and take a tour of our facility? We'd love to show you this new state-of-the-art equipment that we have. That's your T profile group, right? Like that's your potential and partner who wants to be engaged in this conversation a little bit more deeply but there is room for all voices at the table from your employer partners. And I think that's the critical thing to remember. We just want there to be on ramps for every type of employer to engage in this conversation. So hopefully that's helpful. And again, we are happy to answer any questions and we'll share the link for the employer engagement guidebook in the chat. So you can start to read through some of those best practices and things that we've highlighted um, from our partners. And then again, just from partners across the country who've done some really fabulous work. So. Um, and with that, we are going to go ahead and jump into our panel discussion. I know that our industry partner is running a little bit late. Again, par for the course. These are busy folks. So this is a perfect example. So we're going to go ahead and start with our, um, our, our in institution folks and get kicked off with them. So I will let them introduce themselves. But we do have Frankie here on the call with us and Jennifer on the call with us. So Frankie, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Frankie Adams. I work at the College of Eastern Idaho. Um, when I started um, working on this project, I was a program manager within our workforce training and community education. Um, I'm now an instructor on the, we call it the credit side of the college. Um, but I've enjoyed working on this project so much that they have let me stay on board as the um, lead digital media instructor. So um, I'm happy to be here today. Thanks, Frankie. Jennifer, could you introduce yourself? Hi, good afternoon, Jennifer Houston. So I am, my title is Director of Workforce Training and Continuing Education, and I'm at St. Paul College, right in the heart of downtown St. Paul here in Minnesota. Um, and my team um, handles all of the non-credit training throughout the campus. So very similar to what Frankie described, I have a team of um, folks that work on that non-credit training. 
Thank you both. And thank you for taking the time to be here. It's exciting to have the opportunity to hear about what you all have done. And you all are part of our, what we call in the engine, our cohort three group. So um, your best practices are not demonstrated in this guidebook. So this will be used for version three, spoiler alert for the future. But so this is you know a great opportunity to have that conversation. And I do see our industry partner, Crystal is able to join us. Welcome Crystal. And I know that you just jumped in and I'm putting you on the spot, but would love for you to introduce yourself if you're on and able. I'm in my car, so sorry I don't have my camera on, but um, hi, I'm Crystal Zemak, and I'm the Director of Dealership Development from Teton Auto Group in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Um, Rachel, is there more than you want than that introduction? That's perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys for introducing yourself. So we're going to go ahead and just, we'll jump back and forth with a few questions. And, you know, as I ask these questions, if it's bringing up something else for you, please feel free to elaborate. Um, you know, we've got a lot of folks on the call who have all sorts of different needs as it relates to employer engagement, both from the institution and the employer side. So feel free to, to dig in a little bit deeper if there's something more that you'd like to share, whether it relates to, you know, this micro pathway work or not. So this is really just about sharing best practices with folks who are in the room with us today. So for our institution folks, um, what is your institution's strategy and approach to employer engagement? Just sort of from a broad perspective, how does your institution think about and then approach employer engagement? And Jennifer, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think um, for us here at St. Paul College, it's really about making that employer feel valued um, because as we've seen already today, like their time is very precious. And so um, how can we make sure that it's quality time? It might not be the quantity that we want, but really valuing what we get out of them. And the college um, does a lot to really make sure that what is heard and what we hear from the employer is directed throughout the building and throughout the institution. So really, you know, we actually heard you and here's how we implemented it. So really kind of that value is pretty important. So what I'm hearing too is there's a feedback loop. So yeah. so there's some follow-up with employers after you've sort of gotten, you know, gotten that feedback or that initial input from them. Absolutely. And who else throughout the building here can really use that valued feedback as well? Is it our program advisory boards? Is it our foundation that may be out looking, you know, for some fundraising ideas? So really um, trying to have the best way for them to connect so that they're not contacted by six different people throughout the campus, but feeling valued and feeling heard from one person that can then, you know, share it throughout the building. Love that, love that. Thank you. And Frankie, how about at your institution? I'll echo what Jennifer just said. Um, we really, we value our um, employer engagement. Um, we know that the value that it offers to our programs and what it looks like to have their input. Like Jennifer said, just knowing or informing them of how much we appreciate their input. Um, we, before we became a community college, we were a technical college, and so we value technical advisory committees. Um, we feel like we do a good job at maintaining and building those committees, and we could not build the programs that we have without the input of our partners. Um, and so we just, you know, we continue to build and maintain those long-term relationships. Um, like Joe mentioned earlier, there's a tier of involvement, or I think, I, I think he called it a tier or a ladder of engagement. Um, some of our collaborations are just one-off collaborations, but a lot of our partners are long-term partnerships. So, Perfect, thank you for that. And so, yeah, I love the idea again that you're already thinking about how do we tier these experiences and make them meaningful regardless of what time an employer can give us. So I think that's really, that's really important. Um, so that's one example, but just thinking about, you know, can you share an example of how coordinated communication and structure has improved your work, your either program or workforce outcomes? So maybe just, you know, an example of what that's looked like just in practice. And Frankie, we'll start with you since you're already off mute. Um, yeah, I was really excited about this question. So we... Um... A recent example that we have um, is our medical assisting program. It was a two-year program, um, and we learned at one of our technical advisory committee meetings 
that that wasn't aligning with what workforce needed. Um, they needed a shorter program, um, a more condensed program. And so after reviewing um, with our state board and reviewing with our instructors and our workforce needs, we were able to modify that program. And that was in response to the workforce needs and our community partners. Um, and that happens a lot. Um, another example is our cybersecurity program. It is hard to find instructors in the, the field of cybersecurity. Um, oftentimes they don't want to, to be educators, but they are willing to be adjunct and to come in in the evening and help us um, teach classes. A partnership that we have right now, um, our adjunct um, instructors are working full-time and their employer is paying for them to come and teach. And it's, um, it's working out great because we get those industry professionals in the classroom. Perfect. Thank you for that. And I love, again, I'm hearing flexibility. Like that's just what I'm hearing is the ability to be adaptive and flexible and strong communication with your employer partner throughout. Perfect. And Jennifer, how about for you? Yeah, um, so something that's we started and has been a really good example of this kind of coordinated communication, we work really closely with Ramsey County, which is a large county that we're embedded in here in St. Paul, and um, we do different programs, you know, they're one of our biggest partners right now on this micro-credential that we're running, but in the talks of this and having their students here and you know getting in further in conversation with them i was able to connect them with other folks on our student affairs side and we actually have now developed they have a ramsey county um, worker that is housed on our campus and here for any student whether they're a part of this program or they're just a you know in general a credit side St. Paul College student that might have questions about their benefits or their SNAP assistance or their EBT cards or anything like that so we've been able to really kind of make that communication go across campus and embed them into our system here so that all of those students have another resource to be able to go to um and it's just been I don't think that that would have come about if we didn't have a really like goal-minded communication strategy in place with the county. So that's been a really positive for us. And that is such a fabulous partnership. And what a very cool model and example of how to leverage employer engagement in multiple facets, right? Like Ramsey County having a presence on your campus and being visible to your learners so that they can actually see themselves in that work and understand what that work can potentially look like. They also act as an employer. They also act as a job placement. I mean, that's just like such a fabulous multiple, you know, multifaceted example. So yeah, absolutely. love that. And again, can't wait to highlight that in the next iteration of our, of our guidebook. So Jennifer, thank you for sharing that. Now, just thinking about how you leverage data and outcomes in order to sustain those relationships. So maybe thinking a little bit about the way your institution tracks and manages data as it relates to micro pathways, whether that's workforce programming, credit, non-credit, however your institution has decided to build those. How are you tracking data for those learners through those experiences and then you know, leveraging those for decision making about how you want to do this work? moving forward um, or alter, you know, or iterate on your micro pathway models. And Jennifer, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, so this is fairly new for us. Um, and I don't think that we necessarily have a tight plan in place, but we do have past success to show, right? Like I think one of the reasons that my team was brought into the micro-credential conversation is that we have previously had, and, and Jimmy knows this from working in our system, we, um, we don't, have the greatest system for tracking data. It's kind of a homegrown system that we call ISRS, and it's a, a struggle every day. Um, but we did finally figure out, because non-credit didn't talk to credit, so we figured out kind of a roundabout way to run a report to see over a certain amount of fiscal time how many of our students that started with a non-credit class ended up somehow taking a class on the credit side. Um, and it, we were close to 27%, which is huge. So I think for us, you know, as we work to try to put together what this data is going to look like and how we're going to use it to continue leverage leveraging other outcomes is just keeping that in mind. And, um, you know, one of the things that has been great about working with um, the lab is having other ways to maybe track the data that's easier 
than using our cumbersome system that our state has. Um, so I think there's still more for to come on that for us, but it definitely is a success showing that we do get students to, to matriculate from non-credit to credit and just to kind of continue to see how these pathways keep that moving forward. I love that example. Thank you. And that, you know, that's something that comes up when we start talking to institutions is how does workforce transition into, you know, degree programs in the ac academic side of the house, right? Like they're all academic sides of the house, but that's always how we talk about it, right? Historically, but the idea that you're tracking that information, you can say, oh, you know, this percentage actually did matriculate. That's huge. And being able to talk about that, those are really probably potentially learners who otherwise would not have found their way to your institution or to post-secondary education in general. And now through this work are able to see that education trajectory for themselves and a meaningful professional trajectory to drive economic mobility and potentially break those cycles of poverty and you know just be better ready for what the future holds for them. So oh, it's so exciting to talk about, I love it. So thank you, Jennifer, for that. And Frankie, how about for you at your institution? It's really the same, the same thing. Um, our non-credit, our workforce training side and our credit side don't have the same software. They don't talk to each other. And so um, it's a challenge on how are we going to track it? Um, and like Jennifer said, we've kind of got a, right now we're just tracking it with the old fashioned spreadsheets and <laughs> um, a good Google sheet or Excel spreadsheet, um, but just watching the learners, watching the outcomes, um, and, and knowing what those outcomes are and knowing what our goals are. Um, and we um, hope to really grow the, the whole lifelong learning. You know, um, we want our students to come back repeatedly, come back for um, continuing their learning, continue learning, continue to grow as um, a learner. So we use the word lifelong learning all the time, but we really, really want to embrace that and express how much we want this and students to embrace that. I love that. Yeah. And you said that, you know, the idea of lifelong learning, this is not a one and done. This is not you finished even the degree, right? Like even after you finish your degree, the opportunity to upskill or reskill if you want to change careers. And what does that look like? And I love that. That's a perfect example. Thanks, Frankie. Um, we came to CEI about doing something similar. They have a really great nursing program there and they partnered with the hospital to build that. And we're in the automotive field and we have a shortage of automotive technicians. So we came to them and said, hey, we want to do something like you have with the nursing program, but we know we're going to have to take baby steps and how can we make this work? And we have a shortage of tech skilled technicians. Um, and so we partnered together to come up with a plan and the micro credentials was obviously all their idea. We didn't, we didn't know that this was an option. So it was, it's been a great partnership because it fits in building a program within the school. But then a lot of the students we bring to them are people who already work for us that need to further their education and further their skills but they couldn't do it during the day because they're working. And so we said, you know, what if we did it in the evening? So we we just brainstormed and Frankie and Mary and Chuck and Lori and everybody have been amazing at CEI to work with because we all just put our heads together of like, okay, well, what works for you guys? Could we start at four? No, we couldn't start at four. What if we start at six? Okay, let's do six to eight. And so that's kind of how the partnership started is us bringing them the idea and then them just feeding off of it. And it kind of just grew into its own thing. Thank you for the the origin story of the partnership. I think that's important to think about sort of how, you know, how does an employer find or, you know, get in touch with someone at an institution? So the fact that, you know, you kind of had the seed, seedling of an idea about what it might look like. And, you know, we were able to sort of help and get it supported from there. Did y'all run into any challenges? or, you know, barriers or opportunities for growth as you went through this, uh, the micro pathway development process. And that's for Crystal. Um, I think that the ongoing challenge, 
there's two parts. One would be selling the idea to our employees. So mm -hmm. these are like entry-level technicians that if they do a specialized course, they get um, paid more with each course. And so selling them on that idea of like, hey, now you don't need to study on your own. Um, we're going to provide the tools for you to do the classroom learning and then the hands-on learning. And then at the end, we'll have you take your ASE testing to get your certification and therefore you can earn more money. But that took a little bit of um, salesmanship because, you know, you're taking their their time off of work. Um, so, but we ended up having a great turnout. So that was, that's just something I think if we can continue to paint the picture that of the success stories, because we had 10, no, 12, right, Frankie, 12 last time. And we've had eight of that. Well, they all took their ASEs for breaks was the specialized course and eight of them passed their ASEs. So that's a success story right there. But like I said, we did have to sell them on that. So that was a challenge. And then the other challenge, just like industry to school challenge is is what Frankie just said, the tracking, like we're, we are using a Google spreadsheet um, and we're making it work. Um, but I think we're, we're having to over communicate about stuff because we don't work together every day. So sometimes we don't speak the same language so we have to, okay, what did you mean by that? When am I going to get this? We have to, hey, have you heard from anybody at the college? No, I haven't. Have you heard from anybody? No, I haven't. Okay, let's make a phone call. And then they'll, they're probably in the same boat. Like, have you heard from anybody at Teton? So, you know, just that trying to connect sometimes has a delay because you're not in the same building as each other but we figured it out it's not anything that's like oh this is the worst it but it has been a little bit of a challenge no that makes sense and you know you talked about language and I think that's a really critical piece too and you know how do we translate between industry speak and higher ed speak in ways that make sense and so we can ensure that we're all talking about the same thing and if we're not how do we have a shared definition um, so that we can be on the same page. So I appreciate you calling that out, Crystal, especially again, from the employer perspective, that's important for us to hear. So thank you for that. Um, Frankie or Jennifer, anything that you want to share in terms of challenges or opportunities or barriers that you faced in, you know, developing your micro pathway programs and things that you did to address those related to employer engagement? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I'm sure any institution on this call is struggling with it, but, you know, finding students. There, there is a lot of money out there and available right now for free trainings and free professional development and education. And um, so you're really struggling and, and kind of battling with many different things to find the right student that really is looking for this program. Um, and really interested in in getting what you can or they can out of the micro credential. So I think that's something that um we struggled with. And you know, our partner um Ramsey County had to push our start date back because they couldn't, you know, get the right amount of people and we wanted to make sure it was successful. And so I think just being flexible was important and understanding that, you know, you have to come and meet your employer's needs. And if even if that is outside of the, the box of the typical semester long program or, you know, a different calendar arrangement than what the college is normally used to, um, just being as flexible as possible and um, helping them whenever possible. You know, Ramsey County reached out to us and we actually attended their um they call them kind of like open houses or or kind of fairs that they had talking about this program so that we could be there as a representative of the college and answer specific questions for the participants about like, where do we go on the first day? How do we park? Um, what does the software look like that we're using? You know, just being able to be right there and help and make sure that the and partner and the student has all the questions answered that they need to help get as many more students in the program as possible. And it was a success. They filled all 20 seats and we have, you know, 20 students sitting in our first class right now. So it's pretty exciting. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Jennifer, for that example. And Frankie, what about you? Um, I think 
one of the biggest challenges, and Crystal can probably will probably agree to this, the education industry, we are sometimes a little slow, a um, little slow because we have other partners. You know, we have the State Board of Education that we have to answer to. Um, we have to submit approval for classes sometimes. And so there's a process um, where some of our industry partners, they're moving a lot quicker. Um, than us. And so just finding something, um, you know, being flexible and, and understanding how each industry operates, which I cannot speak highly enough of Crystal and the team at Teton Automotive for their patience and their understanding. And when we went into this, we agreed that we would give each other grace, right? We were going to, this was going to be a process. Um, we were going to have challenges, but um, we have built a great relationship that when there are challenges and when things do come up, um, we're able to work through them. And so um, they have, they've been wonderful. And our partnership is something that I can see just continuing to grow. So I would say the biggest challenge is the two different industries um, trying to understand the same language and just finding a balance that works and a great way to communicate. <laughs> you need to find your crystal. That's what I'm hearing. Is That's right. Your magic crystal. It's perfect. <laughs> Um, so I would, you know, I just, I want to call out one piece that I'm hearing here too, is giving back, right? As institutions, we want to be sure that we're also giving back to our employer partners in a consistent way. It's not just about always asking them for a meeting, always asking them to fill out a sheet, always asking them for a survey or data, but what can we give them in exchange? You know, Jennifer talked about going to an event and just being present, right? And so like, what are things that we can do as institutions to show up and support our employer partners and whatever their initiatives look like? and just truly being partners in that work and in making sure that it goes both ways. Um, so that might take a little bit of creative thought partnership with your employers, but there are opportunities. So definitely something to think about. And I love those examples. Thank you. And so thinking about, you know, what next steps and Frank, you, you said, you know, you foresee this being a very fruitful relationship going forward, which is wonderful, but how do you continue to create that joint vision? Right. Like, how do you continue to think about, you know, Crystal and Teton, but then just your the other partners in your ecosystem and continuing to forge that joint shared relationship and vision for what work can look like in the future? So we have this first push, but how do you continue and keep that motivation going with your relationships with your employer partners? And I'll toss that over to Jennifer to answer first. Yeah, I think um, so. One thing I've learned, and this may not surprise Jimmy, but like, I, I was kind of like, when I first started this project, I was like, okay, yeah, I get it. Like we're going from non-credit to credit. Like, why do we have to meet every other week and do all these steps? And like, but that process is what taught me the value that I've gotten out of every step along the way. And so now what I see going forward is us actually, we've already discussed four other pathways that we're going to try next to use this same process that we were able to learn and really building in the value, listening to these relationships that we have now with these employer partners and Ramsey County and just say, okay, what's next for you guys? What did you, did you get certain funding in a certain area? You know, here in Minnesota, green energy is really big right now. So great. You have some money you need to spend in green energy. Let's take a look at what we can do on a micro-credential side to develop something for you. So really just being open and listening and respecting the process and helping our partners to understand the process. I mean, I think it took us, I can't even tell you how many months to get a T-Pro file done, but we got it done. And just, you know, after doing that, then seeing the value in it and understanding like, okay, yes, we need to listen to these partners. We need to figure out what are some other things that we can help them with. And now it kind of is the gold standard, I think, here on campus. And everybody is so excited about this. And we have deans from the credit side coming to us saying, hey, I need help growing this credit side program. Can we figure out a micro-credential pathway that we can build into it? Like, So it's really fun to be able to be on the other side and and be able to help that way. So it's just, it's very exciting. And, and I hope that the relationships that we have continue to build that way now because they see us as a, an organization they could come back to um, and we can really respond to their needs. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. 
What about for you, Frankie? Um, so in the beginning, we talked about, um, you know, right now, as we build this program, it is living between um, College of Eastern Idaho and Teton Toyota. Um, but there is going to come a point where we will um, bring on other industry partners, other automotive dealerships. Um, we've even tossed around the idea of having instructors from each of the dealerships um, come and help us teach at CEI. Um, and so we we talked about it early on. We talked about the future. We were excited about the future before we even began. So um, these uh Teton Toyota is a part of our technical advisory committee, and, um, you know, we just, we see that just growing. Um, we right now have one cohort of students, but I've already talked about what it will look like when we have two and three cohorts going at the same time so that students can come in where, you know, we can meet them where they're at. Oh, amazing. Love it. I love talking about the future before the present is even, you know, dealt with. Perfect. Love it. Crystal, I have a question from you that has popped up from our, our audience. And you're going, we're asking this on behalf of all employers everywhere. So no pressure for you to answer this question. But from an employer perspective, how do you view the idea of, you know, what we in higher ed call non-credit credentials or workforce training as opposed to a credit bearing course or program? Do you see a difference in value in terms of how someone comes to you? Do you, you know, is that rated differently on the on an applicant pool? I, as an employer who we have, we're in uh, 10 locations, five states, 500 employees. I do not see it as any different than a regular degree. Sure, there's specialized things. Like if you, if you're going to be a, CPA, then we should, we'll have a different conversation, but workforce, skilled labor, um, even those niche things, I, I think that it gives you a leg up just as much as someone who gets a associate's degree or something in my eyes as, as an employer, um, they have a specific skill set that they got specific training on that we see, um, value in. So does that answer that question? I hope I, for that <laughs> for all employers everywhere. Yes, I think that answers. Yeah, that. <laughs> thank you, Chris. <laughs> Respect yeah. it. So we are getting close to the top of the hour, but I do just have um, a final question for all of our panelists. And just you know, Joe talked a little bit about being sure that you tell this story. There's a lot of really powerful work happening, and there are so many nuggets of success and opportunities and things that came out in this conversation today that we want to be sure that we talk about that. And that helps to sustain your partnerships and also to, you know, put it out there publicly that we can do this work. We are good at this work. We do this in an intentional, meaningful way. We have a framework and we're responsive and flexible and adaptable and all those great things. So what does telling your story look like? And we'll start with Frankie, but Frankie, how do you think you might tell the story of your partnership with Teton Toyota? Oh gosh. Um, just reiterate how important it is to utilize these employers as co-designers, right? Um, we, we need their input. We value their input. Um, that way we don't have to guess what it is that industry needs. What is the skill gap? Um, that's why working with the Teton Auto Group has been wonderful is because they came in, they told us exactly what they needed. They told us exactly what it would look like. Um, and we were able to use our skill set with their skill set and bring something together. And so um, just spreading the word that that these are our designing partners. Um, and so that's that's my new term is uh, employers as co-designers. <laughs> yes, love, love, love that. Jennifer, what about for you? How do you plan to tell your story with Ramsey County? Um, I think for me, I really want to engage the students and the participants to tell the story. Um, you know, that was a, a part that I think we struggled with and took us a little bit longer to work through on the front end when we were really like designing the student, right? That would be, and I, I forget, I can't remember the name of that right now, but um, going through that process really made me understand that like 
someone's going to learn about this and they're going to understand the most about it from the person that's in the program now. Like, I feel like a lot of times, even probably people at the county here at the institution, we can stand up and talk about things until we're blue in the face. But when they see a success story and they see someone that did exactly what we were looking for, we were hoping for in, in this micro-credential pathway, that to me is what I'm looking forward to in telling the story. You know, and even if they don't make it all the way to the credit side of the path, let's say they just make it to employment. I mean, that's a win. So we want to tell as many of those wins as we can. And I think having the student and participant do it for us is going to be the most rewarding. I totally agree and support that. So, you know, driving the learner voice to really be that beacon for your programs and, and the work that you do, I think is critical. And you talked a little bit about our uh, learner persona development work, I think is what you were mentioning. But yeah, it's critical to understand who you wanna serve in this work and just go beyond those statistics and demographics and really think more holistically about your learner population and then who's not on your campus. So yeah, love that. Thank you for that. For that. And then Crystal, what do you think about telling the story? It sounds like internally there might be some opportunities to talk a little bit about this, but what does telling the story mean for you? think that it kind of comes back to recruiting if you're talking to an employer so if you're on the education side and you're talking to a potential employer about doing this everybody's having that employee shortage and in automotive specifically technicians are what we say is you have to build them or you have to pay them to relocate. And so you have to have multi layers. And this is just one more tool in the employer's tool belt to build the workforce that you want. So if you're, if you can't pay to relocate some very skilled technician from, we're in Idaho, say you can't pay them to relocate from Seattle or something to Idaho, then, okay, how are you going to build that technician and partnering with your local college can really help you tailor it to what you're looking for. And it and it's like Frankie said, it's been a partnership. Um, we have, they have the, the knowledge and automotive background, they have an automotive program, um, but we have the, the people in our industry who do it every single day. And so that's one of the stories I like to tell is like, it's not just a, a CEI program, or it's not just a Teton Toyota program, from the beginning, we've said if other employers want to get involved, great. We like to have an abundance mentality versus a scarcity mentality. If we can build more technicians throughout Southeastern Idaho, that's great for high school students all the way to people who are a little bit older. So I... I think if I sum that all up, I would just say the story I would tell is reach out to your local college as an opportunity to invest in your workforce because you never know what could come of it. And it's just one more way to build and retain your employees so that they want to have a long-term career with you because you're investing in them really. Love it. Thank you, Crystal, for providing that perspective from the employer side. Ooh, we are just a minute past the top of the hour. This was so fabulous, our panelists. Thank you for your time and for joining us. Really valuable. And we could have spent probably two more hours talking to you. So thank you. And we look forward to continuing to hear updates and highlights. And I know folks have to jump off for other calls, but I do just want to make sure that we share. Um, I know in the chat, we shared the link to the updated employer engagement guidebook. Please go ahead and check that out. Um, and there's contact information in there as well. If you have questions or want to share some of your best practices, we would love to hear from you. Um, and then we also did drop a link to our community of practice on LinkedIn. And we would love for you to join that as well to, again, hear about some of these stories, highlights, and then share your own stories. And again, thank you for our to our panelists and for everyone who was able to attend today. Appreciate your time. Hopefully this was helpful, but we're happy to help if there's anything we can do or other additional resources we can provide. Um, and we look forward to highlighting your best practices in version three of our employer engagement guidebook. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a fabulous day.